I want to introduce our moderator, uh, Ms. Gulnara uh, Kasambet from the BBC. She is a senior producer at the BBC covering Kyrgyzstan uh, and has been a journalist. Yes. She's been a journalist covering the region for uh, 20 odd years, and uh, so I think we'll be in very good hands. Um, and to open our proceedings, I want to introduce uh, the UK ambassador to Kyrgyzstan, uh, ambassador Robin Ward Smith, uh, who happened to be in London, who graciously agreed uh, to introduce uh, Shams Kasimlaka this evening and this program. Ambassador Ward Smith uh, has is the UK ambassador to Kyrgyz to the Kyrgyz Republic, excuse me, uh, since June of, of 2015. He served in a range of diplomatic uh, roles in Algeria, in Romania, in Germany, in Japan, in Iraq, and previously he was the UK ambassador to Tajikistan. So he knows the Aga Khan Development Network well, he knows the region very well, uh, and uh, I will now hand it over to him uh, so that he can introduce our program this evening. Thank you very much. Matt, thank you very much indeed for that uh, welcome. It's a uh, great honor to be here, and it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce my colleague and my friend, Shams, to you. Although I know that there are a lot of people here today who've known Shams for longer than me, so um, you will be able to add in the bits that I miss out. When I read Shams' bio uh, when he asked me to do this a couple of weeks ago, uh, I got onto the second page and I wondered whether I was reading the bio from two or three people because Shams has achieved such an incredible amount in a very distinguished career. Um, uh, as Matt says, I was previous ambassador in, in Tajikistan. That's very good to see Akbar again. Um, so I've had a lot of interaction with, uh, with AKDN, with AKDF, with the whole family um, uh, of the network. Uh, and uh, I have seen both the site um, in Horog on numerous occasions and now Narin as well. Uh, so I can completely endorse uh, the views about what, just what a great visionary uh, and extraordinarily important um, project this is uh, and how, just how needed it is in that part of the world. So um, my congratulations to all of you involved. But if I can just get back to the main reason why I'm standing in front of you, which is to introduce uh, Shams Kasim Laka to you. Uh, Shams, as you know, is the diplomatic representative um, for the Aga Khan Development Network um, in the Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, you probably already know that he is also an education expert. He's executive chairman uh, of the board executive committee of the University of Central Asia. He leads the planning and the building of the University of Central Asia. Uh, uh, and as you know, that was a project co-founded not just by His Highness, but by the three governments of Tajikistan, the Kyrgyz Republic, and of Kazakhstan. In a way, this, uh, this brings full circle um, Shams's work with UCA, because you were there many years ago, weren't you, Shams, uh, when you were negotiating the international treaty um, that, was, uh, that was signed in 2000 to actually establish UCA. Um, prior to that, of course, Shams, as many of you also know, was founding president of the Aga Khan University, uh, where he led the planning, the building, the operations for nearly three decades. Um, AKU, of course, also established by His Highness in 1983, campuses in Pakistan, East Africa, in the, and here in the United Kingdom. In addition to that, of course, Shams has uh, consulted for the World Bank, um, helped with the Nazarbayev University, I understand, with that. Uh, and, of course, previously, Sham served as uh, Pakistan's Minister of Education and Science and Technology in the caretaker government of 2008. Sorry, 2007, 2008. He chaired the board of the Pakistan Centre for Philanthropy, sat on the board of the International Baccalaureate Organisation, was a member of the board of the uh, Benazir Income Support Programme, he was also elected to the steering committee of the Toloi uh, network of 270 universities worldwide. He's a distinguished fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. He's written book chapters and articles 
on school and higher education, higher education reforms, philanthropy, civil society, management. He chaired the committee that wrote Pakistan's National Environment Protection Act uh, in 1997. He led the government task force in Pakistan in 2001-2002 uh, that recommended reforms in Pakistan's higher education that led to major structural changes in, in universities, creation of higher education commission, the doubling of access for students, substantial increase in research output, and a thousand-fold increase in funding. He was a member of the HEC from 2007 to 2011. This sounds like a very full career, but for 20 years before that, <laughs> Shams had been working in business uh, in, the, in the jute industry in East Pakistan uh, and in venture capital activities as MD of Industrial Promotion Services of Pakistan, sponsored, of course, by the Aga Khan Fund for Economic Development. So he was leading a workforce of 22,000, and he built up one of the largest industrial and export houses of Pakistan. Uh, in terms of his own education, Shams did his first degree undergraduate education in, in, here in the UK uh, and has an MBA from the University of Minnesota. Uh, he's received an honorary degree from McMaster's University in Canada and he's quite rightly been uh, given national awards, um, both from the President of Pakistan and also from the President of France. I gallop through a little bit, um, but you will get a you will get a feel uh, for Shams being an extraordinary man um, who is rightly very, very well respected in Bishkek, um, within the diplomatic community, within the government and within the country for what he is, has achieved and what he is still achieving. This is a uh, very important year, of course, with the first students arriving in September in Narin. Uh, I have uh, absolutely no qualms, no doubts that it will all be very successful because of the excellent leadership that is shown and the very strong team that you have. Ladies and gentlemen, Shams. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. President of the Ismaili National Council. Chairman of the AKF National Committee, uh, Mr. Karaj, and uh, members of the Council, members of the National Committee of AKF, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, Namdar Moki Sab, Kamriya Sab, and uh, all the volunteers who are really I was very, very happy to meet the volunteers who've been serving, I don't know for how long, ever since I've been with AKU, these are the volunteers, and especially those who serve the coffee and tea and the lunches that we've had here. It's really wonderful, and I want to thank all of you for organizing this. Particularly, I want to thank uh, Nagib uh, Karaj and his team, and Matt, for organizing and, and inviting me to be here. Um, it's the first time, really, um, we are speaking about the UCA. Um, there's no reason we kept it under covers, but uh, we were following His Highness's uh, advice that let the work speak for it. So there was no reason for us to speak about it until the work was ready. And now I think we are at the point where perhaps we can have uh, some more information for, for our, all our well-wishers. Uh, I also want to thank all the diplomatic uh, uh, core uh, 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 representatives here. I want to thank Gulnara as well for being here. It's, you've really done us a great honor by, uh, by your presence. Um, I also uh, want to uh, thank Robin Old Smith for this very generous uh, introduction. It's very kind of you. We have known uh, each other for a few months, but we feel as if we have known each other for a long, long time. And uh, once you are on the golf course with him, why, there's no way you can, you can ever catch up with him. He is one of the most avid golfers. He's a scratch golfer at St. Andrews. <laughs> He's a member of the, of the club. So uh, you can imagine uh, what uh, new ideas and what excitement he brings to Bishkek. Uh, besides his diplomatic uh, 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 profess. Thank you very much, uh, Robin. 
Um, I, I just want to say one more thing because I'm a little bit emotional tonight because this is the, the town and this is the um, Jamaat where I had the honor and privilege of being a Kamariya of the London Jamaat. And I was a member of the council while I was a student in the UK. And that was in the 50s. So, <laughs> so I can see that some of you probably were not born at the time, but that's okay. We laid the foundations. It was a student Jamaat. And um, uh, we, we had terrific times uh, uh, with all kinds of uh, exciting uh, trips and, and uh, Saturday, uh, uh, what do you call it, socials in those days. That's what they used to call them. Dances and, you know, getting together, music, mayfield and so forth. So I, I just want to say how very happy I am to be back here. Uh, today, of course, our subject is the, uh, the creating the opportunity on the, on the roof of the world. And the roof of the world is, uh, is where Central Asia is. Most of Central Asia in the Pamirs, in the Altai, in the Karakaram, in the Hindu Kush, in the Himalayas, that's the roof of the world. And so how do we create opportunity in this roof of the world? And that's uh, the subject uh, we will speak about a little bit today. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to do was to go through quickly uh, the, uh, the, the introduction to the Aga Khan Development Network. Uh, most of you have seen the big chart I've simply put here on the, on the, on the left-hand side is the economic development arm, the social development arm, and the cultural development arm. And within the social uh, uh, development arm, we have the Aga Khan Foundation, the Aga Khan Education Services, the uh, Aga Khan Academies, and of course the two universities, AKU and UCA. Um, then we have uh, the spread of the Aga Khan uh, Development Network, uh, and it's particularly its uh, track record in education. You can see the red dots are where already AKU exists, including in this wonderful country. And uh, uh, in, in, in uh, the three yellow dots in Central Asia, the, 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 the background of this education uh, um, network is 100 years old. Many people often forget that it was really 100 years ago that uh, the schools were established, the first school was established in uh, Africa and Asia, and the uh, Aga Khan uh, education services and the academies and the universities put together, they have 216 schools in 16 countries and they serve 55,000 uh, uh, students. Now, so the University uh, of uh, Central Asia, uh, I think, owes, like many of the things that owe to His Highness's vision, and when he laid, when the foundation stone of the ceremony, uh, foundation stone ceremony of the university was laid in, uh, in Tajikistan, uh, in Khorov, His Highness's uh, uh, extract from that speech says, by creating intellectual space and resources, the university will bring the power of education and human ingenuity to the economic and social challenges of mountain societies in Central Asia and elsewhere. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the challenge that His Highness has posed us. It's very easy to write those five, six, eight lines, but when you unpack the meaning of that, it becomes very powerful, and that's the vision that's guiding the team that is, is, is working uh, uh, together at this time. I just wanted to mention that without this vision, uh, and, and the tremendous support we have received from the governments of, uh, from Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, the presidents of those countries, uh, we could not have achieved uh, what is at this time uh, the, the situation. So let's look at the context. The context is we have the Central Asian, and I'm referring basically to the main three countries where we are uh, functioning. We have the Kyrgyz Republic, population six million, uh, GDP $1,200 per, uh, per capita, and literacy rate, guess what, it's 99%. Wow, that's something that any country can be proud of. And what about Kazakhstan? Ooh, you have 17 million people, 12,000 GDP per capita, and 99.7% literacy. 
And then, of course, we have Tajikistan, which is not to be left behind. And that also has a population of 8 million, but the, the GDP per capita is 1,100. So there is a huge difference between uh, the, the, the Kazakh 12,000 GDP per capita and the, the Tajik one, which is 1,100, though literacy, and that uh, is about the same, and that is largely a, a consequence of the Soviet Union's emphasis on literacy, good health, opportunities for everyone. Very often we hear about the, the, the legacies of the Soviet Union, but don't forget that it's some very, very powerful th contributions to human development. And that I, I always marvel when I, when I look at the outcomes in Central Asia. But then everything is not necessarily uh, measured in, and uh, development is not always measured in terms of literacy. You can make, put everybody in kindergarten and through a primary uh, education, everybody is literate, but the, where are the leaders going to be trained? That's the big challenge that we have. That's the big challenge, not just of Central Asia, but of most countries of Asia and Africa. So we look at it in that context and say, when we mentioned His Highness's statement about bringing education to mountain societies, the question is, why bring education to mountain societies? What was the compelling reason for this? Well, look at it. Uh, there's an inverse ratio between the height of the mountains at which populations live and their socioeconomic status. In other words, the higher you live in the mountain, the poorer you are. Inverse ratio. And why is that? You know the answer. When you live up there, you don't have enough pasture, your animals are not so well fed, you don't have seasons to cultivate, it's very cold, and it is far away from health, it is far away from education. So there is this inverse ratio which then results in marginalization of those populations. Marginalization. And by the way, what is the next thing that happens when people are marginalized? They become radicalized because they don't have opportunity. There's this risk, there's a potential for radicalization. And then uh, we have to engage with marginalized uh, of, of mountain societies so that uh, we have the, a university on the roof of the world, for example, in the hope of reversing the social, economic, political, and educational isolation. I don't think we are there to do any political or any development of that kind. We want to have the opportunity, give the opportunity to the people to um, reverse this uh, risk of marginalization through higher education. And then build human capacity to foster development uh, of, uh, and civil society. And education, of course, bridges the divide. And then what happens? Then there is a possibility that graduates uh, become job creators rather than job seekers. That's the purpose. That's one of the most important objectives. It's not easy. Not every university is going to be able to do it. I don't know whether we will be able to succeed. That's the objective. It may take 20 years. It may take 30 years. It may take less. Who knows? Maybe more. But that's the objective. So I wanted to just draw attention to the fact that if you look at Switzerland, two, three hundred years ago, the Swiss weren't the rich people of Europe. Hmm, what were they? They were mercenaries. You go to Lucerne, you find all kinds of monuments to people who were killed in battle, not defending Switzerland, but defending other, the Austro-Hungarian, the Vatican. And today, to this day, the Vatican has Swiss guards dressed in the old Swiss Guard uniform because they were the mercenaries who really defended the Pope for hundreds of years. But then what happened? They got educated. They started getting into engineering. They started making watches. And those who couldn't make watches started making cheeses. <laughs> so every valley in Switzerland has a new cheese. And most of us have had the pleasure of uh, you know, tasting a few of those cheeses, they're pretty good. Those who can't make cheese, then they have viande de grison, which they, they, you know, they put the, 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 the beef uh, and, and air dry the beef, and that tastes very good too, particularly if it's with the cheese. So, <laughs> so this is how, and what happened? They discovered that this beautiful country, 
no different than Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan or, or Tajikistan or the northern parts of Pakistan or Afghanistan. They were tourist attractions. Where do you find these beautiful pastures? Where do you find the mountain flowers and the beautiful yaks and, and the, uh, the hiking that takes place in these mountains? And so when you have that, then the tourists come and those who stayed in the mountains and who were marginalized now have built two extra rooms so they can have two tourists come in and have bed and breakfast and pay them something. And Switzerland has stopped. Have you ever heard about migration out of Switzerland? Not in the, in the little while. But if you go to the United States, there are states in New England and in the middle, uh, Midwest where there are strong concentration of Swiss populations. Just like the Pakistanis came to Bradford, the West Indians came to Notting Hill Gate and wherever else, they have concentration of Switzerland. But that is now stopped. People are very happy to stay in their own country. By the way, that's the model we hope one day that we can bring to Central Asia and parts of that region. That's the, that's, the, that's the objective. So building a university in Central Asia, we had the uh, a treaty of the uh, university between the three governments and uh, uh, His Highness the Aga Khan. And in 2000, uh, or rather in 95 to 98, the commission was established to study uh, what, what should this institution be like. We spent a lot of energy with our colleagues from Central Asia. Some very erudite and academic people contributed this. Uh, their, their thoughts to this, and in 2000, the treaty was signed. And what happened there was that the treaty was then registered with the United Nations as an international treaty, which gave the university certain rights that the countries gave it. They, uh, I mean, the, the investment by the countries is that they have given tax exemptions, they have given land at a very concessional rate, and sometimes almost at a, at a, at a, at a nominal rate, in some cases, and that is their contribution, and the AKDN's contribution is to now pull together the funds in order to build the university. That's not an easy thing, I can assure you. Uh, so we have here uh, the, the three campuses whose, uh, whose uh, designs architecture was uh, Arata Isosaki, uh, an uh, award-winning architect of Japan. All three campuses designed by this wonderful uh, uh, renowned architect. And uh, our aim is to striving for international, uh, internationally recognized standards of education and research. Research, please note research. This is not just education. We need to create knowledge in order to bring those job creators. We need to find opportunities. And that comes out of intellectual application of mind and creating research and fostering socio-economic development of Central Asia in mountain-based societies and helping societies, very important, preserve and draw upon their rich cultural heritage. Hmm, rich cultural heritage, Central Asia, what is this rich cultural heritage? Wait a minute. Some of the biggest mines that the world has ever known came out of Central Asia, came out of this very region. You heard of Ibn Sina. You've heard of uh, Ibn Rushd. You have heard of uh, uh, of uh, the uh, Ibn, uh, not Ibn Rushd, uh, uh, but also uh, Zohar. You have uh, heard about a number of writers, philosophers, uh, and and uh, the people who have gone out, who had scientific publications, scientific treaties. They discovered a lot about astronomy. They discovered the zero. It didn't happen just like that. What was that ferment that created it? And where is it missing today? That's the challenge as Ines has spoke to us. Study the past in order to discern, discern what we should do for the future. And one of the reasons we have understood, at least in our own little way, is that those were societies that were enlightened, where dialogue took place openly where there was an inclusiveness, whether you were from Central Asia, or you came from India, you were from Iran, everybody was welcome to come and, and uh, be at the court. And the, the courts in those days, or the big uh, rich merchants on the Silk Road, they fostered poetry and science. And, and uh, in those days, the technology that existed. So 
uh, we have a situation that we have here preserving and drawing upon the rich cultural heritage. Believe you me, those of you who have visited Central Asia, you know how rich that cultural heritage is. And where is this uh, broad regional coverage of our university? All the, the big three triangles that you see there uh, are, I'm afraid this is not showing up, uh, there, right up at the top is the Tekeli, which is the campus in Kazakhstan, then coming down to Narin, and then there is the campus at Korog. All the yellow uh, dots are different universities that are working with the UCA in partnership, working in the Aga Khan Humanities Project, and also there are the pink dots uh, or pink diamonds where the School of Professional and Continuing Education is, is working as well. So what are we doing? Let's look at the scaling of the regional uh, university in terms of these timelines. The first thing that started was our School of Professional Continuing Education. It is now located in 11 places right across Central Asia. Six of the 11 are in Afghanistan, northern Afghanistan. Not easy. You know Afghanistan is not an easy terrain. It's not just mountains that's difficult. There are other things. And we are out there doing this. And to date, 85,000 learners have come out of the School of Professional and Continuing Education. So before the campuses were ready, people have been getting the benefit of this university. And that's the challenge Zionists gave us when we first presented the feasibility for campuses. He said, wait a minute, this will take you five years. It may take you 10 years, maybe take you longer. And once the graduate come out after four or five years, it will be another 10 years before they get into something that is productive. So what happens? And Central Asia gets no benefit until, you know, everything is ready. Think of the community. Connect with the community. And that's how we are now training mid-career professionals. We are training students to prepare themselves for university education. We are teaching Chinese. We are teaching Russian, English, financial accounting. I'll come to that in a minute. But the capacity building uh, of the university started a long time ago in 2007 when we sent 35 scholars out of Central Asia to do their PhDs in very, very many parts of the world, including this country, Russia, United States, Canada, Germany, China. And then we established our research institutes. Please note again the word research. Mountain Society's Research Institute in 1911, 1912, the Institute of Public Policy and Administration, one of the biggest uh, achievements of this Institute of Public Policy and Administration is the, is the uh, 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 training of Afghan civil servants. Almost all the mid-ranking Afghan civil servants in the Ministry of Finance, are they just don't let us go out. They said, you have to now establish your own campus here in Kabul because we need you, because we are very excited and we are getting benefit out of this. So then we have uh, the Narin campus that is opening this year and in 2017, one year later, we are, inshallah, opening the Khorog campus in, in Tajikistan. And 2019, all going well, we'll have the uh, Kazakh uh, campus in Tekeli and then the first graduates will come out uh, in 2021, inshallah. Uh, so what are the current programs? I mentioned about the School of Professional Continuing Education. You can see the vocational and auto, uh, automobile uh, uh, mechanical training. These, the teachers here are trained in Germany and, and uh, you know, computer systems of automobiles that teach this to the young people. And uh, then we have, sorry, uh, we, have the, uh, we have the cooperative called Zindagi where they learn all the crafts. They make furniture, they make doors, windows, and they make a cooperative. And they're supplying it within the, uh, the Gornobadakshan region of Tajikistan. You can see they're working together out of vocational and technical education. They've gone into their own business. And we have uh, also their construction activities. They have become contractors. We make blocks in our campus, in, in uh, cement blocks in our campus in Korog. They're, they're manufactured by these people. So they've got some, something to do. They've got a business now going, cement blocks. And here we have a man called Kalamo Faridun, who receives a, a certificate from our colleague, Dr. Krachenko, 
you can see the university is an inclusive place. You don't have to be having two legs in order to achieve something. And that's what we take a certain sense of pride. We give an opportunity to everybody. And by the way, this is the graduation ceremony, particularly with the Afghan students in here. Why am I mentioning this? Because there are students who come to Khorog from Afghanistan, northern Afghanistan. They spend three months, six months studying. And so what do they study? So I, I was there, and my colleagues are there in that photograph with all the students and faculty. And what happened was that we said, I asked some the, the young uh, women who were next to me, I said, what did you learn here? You come from Afghanistan. What have you learned? So we learned a lot. I said, what did you learn? Tell me. He said, we learned to be on time. <laughs> oh, to be on time. So there is no rubber time, OK? It is 8 o'clock is 8 o'clock. So what else did you learn? So we learned to respect one another. Wow. You take this for granted in the United Kingdom, or in Europe, or in other parts of the world. But in Afghanistan, this is not this is unusual, because everyone is for himself. Because circumstances have made people into that. I don't blame them. So education brings this opportunity to connect and respect. And I said, what else? So a teacher from the back said, and they learned hygiene. What a wonderful education. Women saying, we learned hygiene. Because one of the biggest problems in Afghanistan is primary care and health. Infection is very high. And mothers and children particularly are big sufferers. So I'm just telling you that the impact is not that we taught them English or accounting. It is much broader. And these are the young women. You can see them there. And then Aga Khan Humanities Project, which is, what is it? It is the development of critical thinking and writing skills within multidisciplinary humanities framework. Big words. Big words. 57 universities in the region are using this program which we developed to broaden the thinking, to become critical thinkers. And 11,500 students have been trained by 500 and odd faculty members. We have the Mountain Societies Research Institute I spoke about, and of course the Institute of Public Policy Administration, and then Cultural Heritage and the Humanities Unit. We have actually a unit which teaches people about their culture, promotes music, teaching of music. They go right into school uh, uh, the classes. Three and a half thousand people in Kyrgyzstan are learning this music uh, from our programs. And of course, the research publications are all coming out as, uh, as we speak. So the undergraduate program is, of course, the capstone or the, or the jewel in the crown of the university, which is now being prepared. We are building only phase one of the undergraduate program because Let's learn and then go forward. Let's build and let's get some experience. So in Narin, when we are starting this year, we're teaching computer sciences, communications, and media, and Central Asian studies as a minor. And in uh, Korog, it is earth and environmental sciences. You heard about all these mudslides and, and uh, di disasters from earthquake. That's what we are going to teach, climate change, and economics. And the minor is a development studies. And in Tekeli, we've got engineering sciences and business management and globalization studies. And the language of instruction, hmm, you should be proud of this one. It's English. So we have a five-year program. Why do we have a five-year degree program? Because most parts of the Central Asian world, they have only 11 grades, up to Form 5, if I use a British term. So there's no Form 6. So if you want to give them international quality education, then we have to uh, prepare them to absorb that academic uh, rigor. And therefore, we train them for a whole year to become uh, educated to a level where they are now getting into university. And then, of course, there are four years uh, that, uh, just, to, just to mention after that, we have a liberal arts uh, uh, and general education in the second year then prerequisites for the, the, the majors that they're going to take, then the required majors courses are, and the minor courses are in the last two years. And that's, the, of course, the graduation. Now, <clears throat> how do we get into a world-class education? Easy to say. 
But how does it happen? So the first thing we do is we are making partnerships with renowned universities, learning from them. How did you do it? Can you help us? Can you train our faculty? Can you help us develop a, a course? And so one of the first things we did, you can see we had an agreement with Seneca College in Canada for our preparatory program, the first program. And that's going extremely well. We are in dialogue with the University of British Columbia, with the University of Toronto. We have already made arrangements with the Higher uh, School of Economics in Russia and the school, uh, Stockholm School of uh, Economics in uh, Riga. And we are working with other institutions from a variety of places in this world so we benefit from know-how where it really exists and not just one source. This country, in Cambridge, we have a good arrangement and we are very proud of that agreement that some of our folks are being trained. And we have the global faculty and experts who come and we recruit them and we prepare them somewhere else. And then, of course, the liberal arts education is where we think it will broaden the minds of these young people. And we are, our selection and, and admissions in this undergraduate program is based on merit. And what do we mean by merit? There's a written test and, of course, there are interviews, and then comes the potential for leadership that we have to assess and say, if this girl has potential for leadership, maybe we should give her an opportunity because everybody has good marks. But the motivation to study and leadership are very powerful. We learned that at the Aga Khan University. It made a big difference when we put that into the equation. And of course, 2016, we announced uh, admissions, and we have 522 applications for 70 seats. It should have been more, but for the first year, I'm personally very excited about it. And they are good, strong candidates. We have already shortlisted 204 of them. And there's a strong competition from all three countries. There will be application from Pakistan. We have application from Afghanistan. And uh, by the way, what will it cost? It's going to cost 5,000 for tuition and 3,000 for room, board, laptop, library, sports, everything else. And that's 8,000 annually payable in your national currency. We are not asking them to pay in dollars. That's, they don't earn in dollars. And the fees are benchmarked against uh, other high quality uh, regional institutions. So we are not an outlier. But believe you me, 8,000 is not the cost. It is at least four times that much. Who's funding it? Hmm. Who funded this center? Hmm. <laughs> so we have here financial aid of course, our aim is to diversify that. Because His Highness has said, I will take care of a particular period. He told us at AKU, first five years of losses, I will bear. Then you tell me when you're going to recoup. And then when, when you're going to recoup, and when am I going to get back that money? Because then I can plow it back into the university. I remember when he said that to me, when a single brick had not been laid. He said, I want to see the cash flow. When are you going to break even? And when you're going to recover money? And I said, 11 years before we repay you the money. In five years, we break even. Believe you me, half my hair I lost because of the first five years. <laughs> so merit-based scholarships are given. And there are needs-sensitive grants. People who don't have the highest merit, but they are needy. They're, they're orphans. Maybe they come from poor families. And then we have interest-free student loans. These are not one of these interest-bearing loans. There's interest-free. There's a very small service charge, but the, uh, the, the loans are interest-free. And, and then uh, up to 90% you can have of your fees of 8,000 paid by the university if you have a deserving and if you can prove to us that you are the deserving candidate. And financial need will not affect admissions because which is solely based on merit. First we admit them and then we ask them, have you got the money? How can we help you? How, where, where have you heard this happen before? Well, that's one of the objectives His Highness said. Nobody should be denied education because they don't have the ability to pay for it. Believe you me, this is very difficult. Now, quickly, we look at the campuses and their settings. This is the Tarin town where we are building our first campus. Look at the mountains. Look at that valley. There's a river running through that. And that's the first phase of our campus, which is uh, the, this is the academic building here in the U-shaped. 
the other three buildings are dorms and this first phase by the way is part of this whole master plan look at the big master plan that is going to happen in four phases and this is the status of the Narin campus in July of 2014 22 months ago and this is the status uh, today in 22 months and so let's quickly run through this this is the entrance uh, of the of the academic building the classrooms the faculty residences I can already see some people saying well maybe I should become a faculty member over there. <laughs> and by the way these are student dorms ah now there we go so here is a faculty uh, lounge terrace overlooking the beautiful river and the mountain. This is how we want to trap our faculty. <laughs> give them the opportunity to perform and give them the attractive surroundings. And of course the student lounge and the library. This is just the first phase. And classes begin day one in Narin campus, 8 a.m. 5th of September. That's a date was fixed two years ago. So, so you can see this is the result of collective work. It's not Shamska Simlaka. It was not my idea to build this university. I don't do the construction. Our job is to be the orchestra. You know, we got the orchestra, we got to lead that. And of course, this is Korog town. Again, you can see the valley, similar. And in Korog, we are building uh, again, phase one of this, uh, of this campus with those uh, white buildings that you see over there. And this is the way the, the master plan is and within which we have this little section that we are building. And this is how it will look when it is finished. By the way, where we are now, we were in May of 2015, one year ago, we were in this condition. And in May of 2016, it is this. We don't let any grass grow under our feet over there. So classes there begin. Oops, they're not going to begin. <laughs> September of 2017. This is our objective. And uh, then we have the Tech Elite Town Campus, which is the whole campus, and the red sections are phase one of Tech Elite. And this is how it looks. And then what is the socioeconomic impact of this? When you build a building like this, at the university, we have in total Narin campus 85 million, Korog 95 million, and technically this is 105 million dollars that will be spent. And what will it achieve? Job creation, economic impact of this will be 1,800 construction jobs are, each campus has 600 construction jobs in a place that's depressed, there are no jobs. And 98% in Korog, for example, most of you know where Korog is in Tajikistan, 98% of the workers and 80% of the engineers work from the town and the oblast of, uh, of uh, Gorno Badakhshan, right? The local people. And 40% of the works packages were awarded to local contractors because they won the, the contracts. We didn't give them because they are local contractors. And there's 300 new faculty jobs and staff jobs will be created. And job creation and economic impact of the university will be 350,000 jobs. Uh, 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 you know, the, the days of employment have been created. Secondary employment, we estimate to be 750 million generation of economic activity. Look at the ripple effect. And of course, there are examples. I'm running out of time, so I will not spend too much time on this. Maybe we'll catch up. But Samat Kalidudoyev is a contractor that didn't know much about building. He became a small sort of built the walls and things like that. Today is one of the contractors out of our university's uh, work. And here is a wonderful example from Narin. This gentleman, uh, 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 Jakipoy Chubak, he was a small egg, time, egg farmer. Uh, you know, poultry farmer. He had maybe two dozen uh, chickens and he said to our School of Professional and Continuing Education, I want to join your entrepreneurship program. So they said, fine, come along, join. This is the fee. He paid it and eventually he learned uh, about doing a, you know, a business plan 
And then a part of our study is send him to Bishkek to see how other poultry farmers do it. So 15 days he was there. He learned how it is done. He came back. And what this Jackie boy did, he spread the word with his friends. All right, you keep some chickens and you keep. And before long, we had a cooperative of chicken farmers. And all the chickens and all the eggs that we eat on our campus in our welfare facilities are all coming from Jackie Poy. Here is actually the impact taking place. Uh, and uh, here is the man, the person on the, on the left hand side is uh, Hafiz. Uh, Hafiz is an engineer. He was not an engineer. He was working in the AKDN office as an administrative guy. But he always wanted to be an engineer. His family could not afford it. So when the AKDN office saw that he had this capacity, they sent him to England to do project management. And before long, he became involved in the Korog project. And today, he's the head of the Korog construction, building $95 million of construction. He's supervising. He's from Korog. I mean, how can you, how can you not uh, you know, admire what these people are doing? Look at the grit. And then, of course, uh, we have high quality employee welfare facilities. We got very nice canteen. By the way, canteen is run by a local, uh, you know, uh, Jackie Poy's friend who <laughs> buys the eggs and chickens from him. <laughs> <laughs> so you remember the song which says they are laying eggs now. So that's, that's creating a multiplier effect. And then we take care of our, our uh, workers, their blood pressure, their sick. We got a nurse on board, doctor. Uh, so there are uh, beyond the campus. There are things that are, that's very important. I want you to see this: that we've just re uh, opened a family medicine and diagnostic center in Narin. It has got all the facilities for X-ray and uh, all the tests, plus endoscopy. There's no endoscopy equipment in Narin, entire oblast. So the, from the day it has opened, there are seven to eight endoscopies every single day. And that's the benefit that the community gets. Because His Highness said, look, it is no good having just the university. We do something for the people. The people can also benefit out of it. And so we have the center. We are proposing to build a university in, in, uh, in Narin, and of course, Korog. And there will be housing facilities that we are proposing for the faculty, where they can live outside the campus. Uh, and the town people can also participate. And early childhood development is about to be started very soon. And we are renovating a park inside the town. This park is a beautiful, it, it was a very torn, you know, it, a very shabby park. And we're investing, we're bringing plants from 60 different species from outside of uh, the town and bringing them in. And so just to conclude, you will see this is a, st a quote from His Highness's statement at the first a graduation of the medical school, where he says, al Oxford, Heidelberg, and Harvard are in AKU's bloodlines. But it is strongly influenced by its times and its location. That's the first university His Highness established. All of you know about AKU, right? And I have to tell you that the bloodlines are now coming into UCA. So you have the AKU on the left-hand side, UCA, inshallah, that same uh, bloodlines that His Highness referred to of scholarship and curiosity and development, they are now coming into UCA. Uh, UCA and thank you very much for this. Dr. Kasimaka, you know, with the BBC, you've got an equipment. You stand on this equipment, hold hands together, and then it counts the weight, the height. Uh, the blood pressure, and according to all of those parameters, it uh, also measures the age of your heart. And oh. I think if you stand <laughs> on that equipment, your heart age will show 30. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you said, first of all, the Afghan students learned how to be in time, right? Yes. You know, I'm from Kyrgyzstan. And for Kyrgyz, there is only three timing, you know? We do not ask what time. We've got only three times, morning, noon, and evening. <laughs> <laughs> and you just said that on the uh, 
in September nine, uh, 2016, the classes will start at 8 o'clock. How are you going to make the students come in time then? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very how, good question. How do you teach them right. to be disciplined? Well, the first thing we want to do, before the students start classes, there's yeah. going to be orientation. Okay. And the orientation period is a whole week. We will teach them not just to keep time, but how to use the library, how to use the internet, how to respect each other, how to have leisure time, uh, and how to study. How to study is also very important. And how to keep your room clean. That's another thing where we have to teach them because everybody is not used to living alone. Many of them are living with their siblings, two and three to the room. And this is the time now they have, will have just two persons in a room with luxurious place. By the way, they've got double uh, bathroom sinks uh, for, for each student in, the, in their own uh, ensuite uh, place. So I think we will have to put our, uh, our uh, rules straight and that is part of education. You also said that uh, alongside all sorts of sciences, you also will be looking at the leadership potential of the future students. Do you think I can uh, enter your university there? You're already a leader. You'll be disqualified. <laughs> and uh, if I enter your university, will you encourage me to wear a headscarf? Uh, I'll tell you what. We have learned this a long time ago at the Aga Khan University. The more you drill people into how to behave, the more complications become. What we did, I, one of my first requests to my faculty was, that let's have a dress code. Oh, dress code! Mm -hmm. As if they were expecting me to lay down, you know, they're going to wear black or white or this or that. And I said, look, the dress code is what you will write down, which will be acceptable to all shades of our students. And the most important statement in that was that you have a dress which is respectful and it is in decorum within the culture within which we are living. So in Pakistan, we don't expect young women to work, you know, short shorts and move around in high heels. That's not, it may happen in Minnesota, but it won't happen and it is inappropriate. So what, and, it, and many people come in the hijab. So that's okay. Some people have a beard, that's okay. As long as you respect the other person's uh, space and their feelings as well. And you don't start to say, this is the only way to dress. You know, when I was uh, invited to chair this short question and answer meeting with you, I'm a journalist and my mind is skeptical. So when I was in Kyrgyzstan, I decided to go to the site and see with my own eyes what's going up there. Shall we see the film? Yes. Embraced by snow-capped mountains, this is the construction site for a new international university. Due to be completed by September, the first students to study in this building have passed through a rigorous selection process. The University of Central Asia was established to promote socio-economic development in the mountain regions of Central Asia. It offers internationally recognized degrees and places an emphasis on the skills needed to develop the mountain regions and their economies. The UCA's curriculum focuses on the unique characteristics of mountain regions and their development needs. Future UCA graduates will specialize in earth and environment, economics and engineering. In addition, students will learn about the history and culture of Central Asia, global processes and development prospects. The campus will provide student accommodation, kitchens and sports facilities. The entire site, including the students' medical center, will be connected to the internet. In May, students from Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan and Tajikistan sat an entrance exam. Now those undergraduates who passed the initial tests are going through the second stage of selection. <laughs> I'm taking extra classes to apply for the UCA this year. If I'm successful, I'll study at UCA. I'm interested in communications and media. I'd like to learn all about new media technology because it's always evolving and changing rapidly. The majority of local people are poor, and for most of the undergraduates, tuition fees are a concern. However, there are grants 
and 10-year loans to support young talent from low-income families. Students will begin to repay the loan two years after they graduate. My family is very big. It will be really hard for my parents to pay for my tuition. I found out about the UCA's financial aid program and I really liked their student loan office. The university provides internships in different companies and encourages students to earn money during summer holidays and save for their tuition fees. Some local Muslim activists are, however, concerned. In their view, if this university is funded by the Aga Khan Development Network, it will promote Ismaili ideology. Dr. Shams Qasim Laka, diplomatic representative of the Aga Khan Development Network in the Kyrgyz Republic, seeks to reassure the public that such concerns are unfounded. The Ismaili community is never uh, is not in proselytization. It does not preach anybody to convert into our sect. This is now a, a historic fact. Over the last 150 years, you will not find this happening at all. Um, and so uh, we uh, were working with our own community. And wherever we work with our own community, we also uh, respond to the needs of those who are neighbors of the community or living with them. The local community is witnessing how Narayan City Park is being transformed into the Narayan Smart Park. Locals are also seeing other changes. Janibek Omikiv is one of the many local residents employed on the construction site. Since the beginning of the UCA construction, approximately 200 to 300 residents from Narin have been employed on the site. In addition, the UCA laid water pipes in the nearby Tosh Bolak village. The university administration is reconstructing the Narin city park into a smart park that will open in August for the people of Narin to enjoy. The UCA campuses are located along the historic Silk Road in Narayan, Kyrgyzstan, Khorog, Tajikistan, and in Tekili, Kazakhstan. But the Narayan campus is located 250 kilometers away from China, a leading economic powerhouse, which may help it achieve its aim to become one of the global centers for economic and intellectual development. found out that there will be a communication and media specialist in Narin, computer uh, sciences. Are you going to drain the brains from the mountains into the big cities? The bra to bring the brain into the mountains uh, from the big cities? Yeah. That's the best thing that I ever heard. <laughs> because what happens is that the cities are draining away people. And, and the best brains of the rural areas are attracted to the city. And from the city, they, then they migrate sometimes. But if we bring the city uh, brains to Narin, with the resources that city people have, their parents probably have, it's a good thing. Because that way, you do attract development. And you, some people who've studied in Narin probably make a you know, home in Narin. Uh, interestingly, uh, one of the computer uh, sciences companies that is in call centers and, and uh, software development, they have said, we are going to have a, uh, our own establishment in Narin. We are in Bishkek, but we are starting in Narin because all the people, the kids that are studying at your university will get them to become interns and eventually they'll join us because they are finding it difficult to, to locate good quality uh, uh, workers. So that's one of our hopes. And you know, I really, really like the idea that uh, everybody will be studying in English, will be studying English. You know, what the help to British citizens who do not learn other languages? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can go on talking with you on and on, but... Um, I would like to invite the audience, if you've got any questions for Dr. Uh, Kasim Laka. Yes, please. Assumption I go back a long way. We are two months apart in our birth dates. So I can probably ask him a couple of questions which 
I take the liberty to do that. Um, I noticed that the buildings are very powerful in color outside. The inside is brilliant and very, very conservative and beautifully modern. Why would you choose that particular type of coloring and, and architecture? Uh, also, a subsidiary question. Obviously, adding so many people to an area which is probably not equipped for infrastructure, how do you manage to create uh, sewage systems and treating all that? Good, very good. Let me answer the first one. Uh, Zul is my cousin, my first cousin. <laughs> so he, he's certainly taken that liberty. Um, uh, uh, first of all, uh, when His Highness selected Arata Izosaki, the, uh, the Japanese architect, uh, there was a very strong brief prepared for the architect. And one of the things that uh, His Highness asked the presidents and governments of these countries is, what kind of buildings would you expect this university, what kind of architect would you like to have? Architecture. And uh, there was a unanimous voice from each of the three countries that we are looking for modern architecture. We are not looking for something that goes back uh, to, to the uh, oriental style. We, we are a modern looking state now. They are all new states at the time. And he said, yes, I, I respect your, your wishes. And so let me think who will be the architect. And eventually the architect was given a brief and it, the architect was to design something that fitted the idiom that fitted it was not competing with the mountains. These are low-lying buildings. There are no big skyscrapers in, in Tekeli or Korog or, or Narin. And it should have a human scale. Now, why all the colors? I didn't understand that until about last year, last fall. I was there in the month of October. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at those beautiful poplar trees. They are absolutely magnificent. And the color of the poplar leaves in October matched exactly the color of the yellow that you see in this building. I said, my God, what an imagination this architect had. And I said, why that pink? And then I started thinking, discuss with my colleagues, and I found that the color of the mountain that's on the, we, we have two mountains, one the red mountain, we have a blue mountain. And the red mountain, certain times of the year when the sun is bright, that's the color. And so that architect has blended those colors within the nature. That's very important. A very and about the architect. sewerage and all of that, I think this is very important. One of the most important uh, elements that we have taken care of is the environmental protection. The heating at the Narin campus, most of the heating there is through geothermal uh, heat. There is no... To bring oil from anywhere is impossible. I mean, it's very expensive. It's there, but it's very hydroelectric city is, is the main part, main source of electricity in that part of the world. So we said, let's use uh, geothermal. And every piece of every every uh, uh, pint of water that comes out of the university, it is purified, and it is purified to the point where it is fed back into the river at the river quality. Uh, which is almost potable. We have, uh, we have uh, equipment that we have brought from Russia and other places, which is very effective. And there was an environmental assessment done by a very important agency, uh, and they, they confirmed to us that our uh, water treatment and, and environmental protections are very appropriate to international standard, not just to Narin standard. Uh, microphone, please. Thank you, Dr. Shamska Samlaka. My name is uh, Dr. Marutsil Tomo Borakshoeva. I'm the author of Islam in Higher Education. And when I was in Pakistan in 2006, I had the honor of meeting you and uh, having a conversation with you. I quote you in my book as well. <laughs> and my question is, uh, probably some of us that are from the region, we have kind of uh, uh, an answer to that, but I want your expert opinion about the challenges that the uh, University of Central Asia is facing as compared to the AKU that you had long experience of building AKU, and we know that AKU is AKU because of you. Thank you. 
Uh, that's a very, very good question. I would say that first of all, it's only been two years that we are building our first campus. So I'm not sure that we have understood all the challenges. But I can say to you, there are more commonalities of challenges than different challenges. A commonality of challenges, let's, two minutes. Uh, recruiting of quality students. Uh, the cost of good education. Uh, somebody uh, asked the pres former president of Harvard that Harvard fees are so high and higher education in America and everywhere is so expensive. And that was President Derek Bock. He said to the, uh, the person who was making that statement, he says, well, try the price of poverty if you think higher education is more expensive. Of course, everybody can't afford it, so we have to make it possible. So our challenge will be how do we make it affordable and how do we create endowments from a variety of sources, variety of well-wishers, maybe alumni in, in 10, 20 years' time when they become well-off, maybe well-wishers. I mean, when AKU started, this was one of the jamaats that really came across and very powerfully supported the university. One day we hope that uh, not just the jamaat, but now in Pakistan, members of the of the business community across the country are extremely appreciative and supporting the university. So that's common. The other problem that we have, a challenge, is that very often there are government regulations or changes in administration, which is the same problem we had in Pakistan. I went through 15 administrations in Pakistan during my uh, 27, 30 years, and I know how complicated it was. So I'm now becoming quite used to it. Somebody said there is a new minister. Oh, okay, good, let's go and talk to him. So, because we have to do that, and that's the meaning of building something and look, taking a long-range view, which is what His Highness has advised. It, it take a long-range view. And uh, believe me, one of the good things is that we have a lot of support from the people and from the governments. They have now understood. For a while, there was a confusion also, whether this will come up or not come up. Why is it taking a long time? I mean, I have to be honest with you. It, look. I'm quoting His Highness. He said, when AKU was established, he said, a good university is not like instant coffee. You want to pour water and stir. Many of you have heard that expression. A, a good school, he said, takes decades to develop the standard. A university will take much longer. So we have to stay with it. And the faculty, most of all, they have to be committed. They have to be high quality. You know, sometimes um, it's more difficult to talk to the local community. It's easier to talk to intelligent, uh, you know, ambassadors, to the UK ambassador in Kyrgyzstan, to the Kyrgyz ambassador in UK, to the ministers, even to the president of Kyrgyzstan. But I think it, it, it could be much more challenging to convince local mullahs. How would you convince them? <laughs> Well, it's interesting you should ask me, because just last week, um, I requested the Kazi of, uh, of Narin. I said, you are uh, Kazi. You, Kazi is, is the head uh, uh, imam. And uh, you, uh, uh, I'm hearing some people are very excited about this. Some people are skeptical about it. Uh, so why don't we have a dialogue? So uh, I said, we had... Just uh, two months ago, we had a town hall for the whole town of Narin. The governor and the mayor of Narin invited three, 400 people. And we sat and we spoke and explained. And they had questions just like this. Their questions were more pointed, I assure you. And they were right, because they didn't know what is this building coming up, and how it is coming up, and who is going to fund it, and what is the purpose. So they asked all those questions. How much corruption is there? Because that's what the first thing that they ask, if so much money is being spent, hmm, who's making the money? So the governor answered that question. He said, you know what, not a single penny is being given by the government, and it is their money, and they are spending it, and I know that I have my people here, they are going and checking out as well, and I'm very satisfied there is no corruption. <laughs> this is the governor making this statement. So I had, I had nothing to report there, but then comes the the, the mullahs. Uh, so they came, and they were quite skeptical, most of them. And I gave the presentation, and 
after that, there was a question and answer session, and there were a list of questions, all written up. Uh, what is the mission of this university? What is the, what is the mission of the Ismaili Imam? Uh, asking the questions that you have, uh, you know, <laughs> hinted at. And I had to explain, huh, so uh, do you pray? What do you mean do I pray? <laughs> I am a Shia, but I am not from the Iranian Shia. It's another branch of Shia. There are many branches of Shia. And there are many branches of Sunni. Did you know that? We are Hanafi. I said, I know you are Hanafi. But there are Wahhabis, there are Salafis, there are Barelvis, there are Devbandis. There are so many branches. So you must respect the pluralism in Islam. This is what gave that ferment that I spoke about in the past. So this dialogue then opened up their thoughts. I'm not sure that they were totally convinced. I don't expect them to be. One <laughs> dialogue is not going to. But by interacting and learning from each other and understanding their concerns. And I said, look, this is a secular university. We are not allowed to teach religion here. It's not charter. Now I don't have a mosque here because it's a secular university. Now can I send my students to pray at your mosque? Will you accept them? Oh, we will be very happy to accept you. Oh, that's nice. I was very reassured because my one of our worries, our board and everybody, we are, how are we going to make sure that the students pray properly? After all, we are God-fearing members of the Muslim community. And uh, whether I'm A or B type of Muslim, that's not my business, as long as they want to pray. And so the mullah said to me, bring them over, I'll be happy to. So we are now in the process of developing how to do it. Any more questions from the audience? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Karim, uh, and I'm talking on behalf of, uh, we have a small charity called Tajik Farsi Action Foundation. We are Farsi speakers of north of Afghanistan. Uh, I really, it was a pleasure for me to listen to you because we are already doing something on a small scale. We uh, collecting some money from here and we're sending to Afghanistan and we're trying to get students to university and usually in Afghanistan there's a concour exam you have to be so usually children from poorer background from the mountainous part they can't get to university so we're running that small program um, and I really admire what you're doing in Afghanistan mainly but ov obviously we want more uh, the fact that those three countries that you are uh, uh, running your project there they benefit from the Soviet education system and the literacy uh, rate was uh, almost above 90%. In fact, in Afghanistan, the literacy, the literacy rate is uh, 90%. So do, don't you think there was a bit of a niche market in Afghanistan so that you should have uh, established your university, especially in the north of Afghanistan or central part where Farsi speakers are and they're quite anti-Taliban, they are quite peaceful and they're running a peaceful life and they would have benefited from this program more. Thank you. Well, let me assure you that the University of Central Asia is not just for the three countries. In the charter that the three countries have actually signed on to, it says we will expand this university in all mountain societies, mountain regions, wherever there is a request, wherever there is a demand, wherever is our ability to do. So we have mentioned the mountain ranges of Altai. We have mentioned Tian Shan. We have mentioned Karakoram, Hindu Kush. We have mentioned the Caucasus as well. Because people from the Caucasus are looking for uh, education and, and, and your mountain ranges in the, in the Hindu Kush and so forth. So, inshallah, one day, let us get our feet on the ground. Let us uh, become stronger and then we will move. Just like AKU started in Karachi. Now it is in seven, eight countries. Inshallah, that will be. And for your charity, there are some uh, Afghan students. If they get in, I will come to you. <laughs> Can I show some nepotism and give a word to my colleague there, yeah? Of course. Hi, uh, my name is Almaz. I'm actually from Naren, so I was... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, so is the minister. Minister Councillor from your embassy is also from Narin. Yeah. Some of the best <laughs> things come out of Narin. I was actually very happy to see the community work that you're doing. Um, my question is, 
mainly related to the topics you decided to teach us undergraduate programs. Uh, why computer science? Because uh, I, I understand uh, it's a niche market. I understand it's developing fast. And there are some very good um, uh, website designers and so on. But they're mainly located in bigger cities. And even internet connection in Narin is a big issue. So is this a step to grab the bull by the horn or? Yes, certainly by the horns at least. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the point is that we have to bring opportunity to the mountain societies. Just by teaching them law and economics and English and Russian or Chinese is one thing. But we cannot be leaving them behind in modern technology, modern means of communications. So uh, how did we choose these subjects? There was a very uh, detailed study undertaken. There was a market survey by Nielsen, one of the most famous market in companies, consulting companies. They determined for us where the jobs are in the future, where they could be going, what is the future of the Central Asian economic development, and even if you have to train people who go away, there should be, if there is, a, there is a reason for them to migrate, well, then let us prepare them to do something that they can make a good living out of. So out of that survey, we chose these subjects which are part of phase one. Now, Mulnara asked me the other day, there is a lot of animal husbandry in Kyrgyzstan. Why don't you have veterinary science? I think her question was very valid. And tomorrow, a friend of mine will ask me, as already some people have, why don't you have the health sciences? After all, AKU is known for health sciences. Why don't you start your own? Inshallah, that may happen. But let's get our feet on the ground and one step after the other. And, and I, I'm quite sure that, and now coming back to your computer sciences question, this is where a graduate with economics degree will get X amount of SOMs, or Tenge, or whatever is the local currency. The computer sciences graduate gets three to six times more, even eight times more today. If he's ready to be uh, employable, he gets that much more. And, and that is one of the reasons why the largest number of applicants in our uh, first batch want to study computer sciences. And by the way, the internet in Narin is getting better every single day. <laughs> we are pushing the government. But I, I really want to take this opportunity before you conclude, Bulnara, if I may. I want to acknowledge the, the contribution made by my colleagues. These are the colleagues that uh, uh, on our board, His Highness is the one who has appointed them. I want to acknowledge uh, Nagib Kheraj, who is a member of our executive committee of the board. Akbar Pasnani, who is also the diplomatic representative of the AKDN in Tajikistan. And there are two others, Shafiq Sachedina, whom all of you know, and Nizar Sharif, who unfortunately tonight they cannot be with us. But I want to acknowledge their uh, contribution to developing the governance structure of this institution. Of course, His Highness and Princess Zara and Prince Rahim have also been involved, so we have to acknowledge their contribution as well. Uh, Amin Mauji here, uh, he's a member of our audit committee. We don't let anybody go. Uh, we make sure that he gets to get into the details so that the money is properly spent. <laughs> And, uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, 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 also Bodan Kwachenko, who has been leading the university. Bodan, please take it. Just <laughs> Bodan is the is the director general of the of the uh, of the University of Central Asia, and uh, uh, he has for the last twelve years been uh, toiling in the trenches, as it were. And thanks to his work that we are able to build on some of this uh, uh, edifice out there. I want to acknowledge some other colleagues, Rahim Somani, who is our CFO. Rahim. <laughs> Dr. Razi Azmat, who is our head of HR. And Muzaffar Jarubov from Korog. He is our uh, <laughs> chief operating officer. 
is not from Khorok, but Roshan, <laughs> but from Gornobad, actually. And uh, have I left out somebody is missing here? Uh, Grant, unfortunately, Grant Robertson, Robertson, I would say, he is uh, a Scotsman. He has done a remarkable job of leading our construction team. And, and uh, the, the construction team, uh, which is almost 95% or 99% from the region, uh, they've done a remarkable job. If you, I mean, that credit should go to Grant and his team. Uh, I, thank you. And I want to acknowledge one other person, and that is uh, uh, Arif Kachra. Dr. Kachra is the Dean of Arts and Sciences, who has really been putting a team together and putting the courses together, doing the partnerships, admissions, all of the dirty work uh, that we don't always see that needs to be done. And I, I must acknowledge he and his team and the entire team of UCA, which is not here, but I think they probably are seeing the web webcast. I want to, on behalf of all of you, to thank them as well for their contribution. And you know, today is Friday, and it's Friday night, and that makes you a terrific audience. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, before we started this question and answer session, I was thinking, how should I address you? If I say just Shamsh in an English manner, that would be too familiar. And if I say Mr. Uh, Kasim Laka, that's a bit too formal. <laughs> and if I was allowed, I would do my own Kyrgyz way. And in Kyrgyz, if a person is older than you, you just call it either Baike, uh, big brother, or if, it's, uh, if a person was a member of the council already in 50s while he was a student, <laughs> we call him Atta. Atta means father, grandfather. So, Shams Atta. Thank you very much. And, and, if, I have to, and if I have to say, if I have to express my gratitude, I will say in Kyrgyz, John Rahman. <laughs> yes. Sir. And look well after yourself. Thank you. Stay this energetic for many years to come.